Operation Unification has, has uh, commenced uh, across all the other states and territories and uh, working in together to get uh, on top of uh, illegal firearms throughout the whole of Australia and send a clear message that uh, the possession of illegal firearms and the activities that are involved in relation to illegal firearms are not condoned. Here in Queensland we've already introduced the toughest firearm penalties in the whole of Australia with mandatory sentences from one year up, right up to five years for trafficking. Uh, we have also uh, implemented through Trevor here from Crime Stoppers as well for the next uh, uh, two months uh, Operation 2 Three, sorry, three, two, one, which uh, instigates people to uh, simply ring Crime Stoppers one eight hundred triple three triple zero, ring up, give their information, and hang up. It's quite simple, but that little message may save their family member or a loved one from uh, obviously the devastation uh, and the effects of uh, an illegal firearm. Obviously, there is, uh, this is targeting the illegal firearms, and you can see from having the success of uh, the amnesty in which 19,000 firearms were handed in. It was great cooperation between the Queensland Police Service as well as the firearm dealers throughout the whole of, uh, of, of the state, and uh, it's going to continue in uh, not just in Queensland but in partnership with the other states for many uh, uh, many years to come. Because uh, I know the, uh, the the acting commissioner is uh, obviously going to to work hard with their, his counterparts to ensure that uh, these criminals, with the changes of uh, unexplained wealth provisions as well as getting uh, tough on firearms, sends a clear message: if you have an illegal firearm in Queensland, you will do time. The community's had enough, and uh, we've certainly given uh, the police the, uh, the legislative uh, uh, enforcement to uh, meet those community expectations. So, Acting Commissioner, if you would say a few words. Thanks, Minister. Look, uh, obviously, ladies and gentlemen, the fact that the police commissioners nat <coughs> nationally have endorsed this campaign, which is one of the very few national campaigns that are run each year, signifies to the community the significance of the issue of illegal firearms in the community. Obviously for Queensland as it is throughout Australia, it's not only a community safety issue but an officer safety issue. And for both of those reasons we want to ensure that the minimum number of illegal firearms remain out in the community and unaccounted for. That's why we're strongly urging members of the community to contact Crime Stoppers if they have any information about people who are possessing or trafficking illegal firearms. Any information that we get we will act on. Every single piece of information we get will be investigated fully and we look forward to getting uh, the sort of results that the Minister has talked about uh, from the amnesty period of recovering even more stolen firearms and getting them off the streets. Thanks, Minister. Yeah, and just to, to add to that, we've had record numbers of the community ringing in in the last couple of weeks. Over 74 uh, people, that's nearly three times the amount of uh, people have rang Crime Stoppers to give information in relation to illegal firearms. And uh, it uh, certainly is a great success, and uh, we're certainly going to continue this momentum and, uh, and make sure that uh, we meet community expectations but send a clear message to criminal elements that uh, you cannot bring your firearms onto the streets of Queensland. So, uh, Trevor, if you'd like to make comments from Crime Stoppers. Thank you, Minister. And uh, as <coughs> the Minister and Acting Commissioner have said, Crime Stoppers is uh, partnering with them in the 321 campaign to have the community report any information. As the Acting Commissioner said, every little piece of information helps when it comes to Crime Stoppers. And importantly, we are a community organisation. So, we're the public face working with our fellow community members to mm capture information and pass it on to the police. To date, 74 pieces of information after 22 days of the campaign. Mm. As the Minister said, that's tripled our daily average. That's 53 telephone calls and 21 internet reports. So if you, uh, as media, wish to, or anyone in the public wants to follow the campaign, visit our Crime Stoppers website, which is qld.crimestoppers.com.au, and you can actually see every morning we update those stats for you so that you can see the latest results. But the community is obviously participating. They're concerned about gun crime and illegal firearms in our community and wish to share information anonymously with Crime Stoppers through the 1800 0 number or the campaign web website as easy as 321.com.au. <coughs> Any uh, yeah. questions? Yeah. Yep. Surprising you, Minister, by some of the things that, that have come forward, the flamethrowers and the crossbows and... Look, it, it, it just goes to show the amount of uh, illegal firearms that, that, that uh, have been handed in through the amnesty. 
and uh, every member knows that uh, obviously of the community that uh, there would be other firearms out there. But the message is now people have a distinct choice. They can do the right thing and hand those firearms in or they'll be doing jail time. And I understand that uh, we had a, uh, a surge within the last couple of days and when I've spoke to a number of those people to ask them why they handed their firearms in is the simple thing is, is previously from other amnesties, they knew at the end of the day they would have gotten a penalty of anything from $250 to $350 for possession of a concealable firearm, whereas now they'll be getting mandatory jail sentences. And it certainly uh, makes, uh, is a greater motivation for people doing the, uh, the wrong thing by the community to come forward. Uh, and I thank them for that. And uh, now the, uh, the, the, uh, the people who will, be, who will have, uh, no doubt, there'll be a certain member that, number that have some form of illegal uh, firearms out there, that they know that uh, the law will be there watching you anywhere and any time. And if you're caught, you will be uh, doing time. Look, it was a broad spectrum right across, and uh, you know we had ones from uh, uh, the um, you know the, the rocket launch in here from down the southeast to the flame throwers and, and so forth, and, and the, the Tommy guns right across all, all areas. It was it was it was a broad spectrum, and uh, what it goes to show is uh, is that it was a great um, support from the community. Uh, to be able to uh, to come forward and uh, present those firearms, and also it's a good partnership between the QPS and firearms dealers because uh, we've set the bar high. For the first time in Queensland's history, we have a weapons advisory uh, committee, and that uh, comes together every couple of months to see how we can get rid of uh, ways red tape and bureaucracy, but but maintain a high standard in relation to accountability in the processing. Oh, there was certainly a broad spectrum right from uh, across from the city to the bush and uh, from the Cape down to the Tweed and uh, it was great to be able to see that, that type of response and, uh, and, and that clear message uh, coming through. Trevor, what's the point of the hang up the last day? Yeah. What do you mean just hang up? <coughs> Once you've provided your information, that's the important part about Crime Stoppers, it's anonymous. Mm. So once you've hung up that phone, um, you have a great sense of relief. You've passed on what you know. People who are told a secret, the first thing they want to do is tell someone else. So you get on the phone, it's really simple. Pick up the phone, tell our operators what you want to tell us, what we can get from you while we've got you, and hang up. It's just demonstrating the three simple steps of, um, and, and it can take just a couple of minutes out of the day to share information, or online. It's, it's obviously not hanging up, but it's uh, generally the term of uh, clearing your browser history mm. and, and and moving on with uh, your daily activities. Can't I hang on and get a reward? You can't hang on to the call, no, because Crime Stoppers isn't a reactive service where we charge down the street with police and, uh, and kick in your door. Information is processed, value added to by police officers and intelligence officers, and it could take some time for the information you provide to actually be investigated and a result. So that code number that we give you during your anonymous call, you can ring back six weeks, 12 months, two years later, and then find out actually whether your information did help mm -hmm. us to catch a firearm offender or solve the crime. And then can I get a reward? Possibly, yes, up to $1,000, depending on the seriousness of the crime that's been solved. Mm -hmm. So the 19,000 weapons, you surprised um, by the, the number? Or is that sort of what you expected? Oh, look, uh, it's uh, an improvement on the last time the amnesty was run, which was, I think, just over 10,000. So a very pleasing result that we got significantly more than we did last time and got them off the street. So I think it's been a fantastic outcome. Uh, we never quite know what the end is going to be when you start, but we're, uh, we're very uh, pleased that it's uh, a very high figure. That's a great result for us and for the community safety. Uh, look, in general terms, I think they're older style weapons that have obviously been kept in families, you know, sometimes handed down in generations, not kept, not kept for any, you know, uh, specifically illegal purpose. Just people haven't got around to, to getting rid of them. This provided the ideal vehicle to do that uh, safely. Uh, 
there would have to be thousands of more firearms out there and we're not naive to think that there isn't but there is deterrence in place now and penalties in place to make people realise and uh, I think that was one of the aspects that we got out of this amnesty is uh, that uh, people who may have had a firearm that was illegal in their possession that they realised that there is more severe penalties in place and they took the opportunity to either register that firearm and do the right thing because it's not just the, you know, from a policing perspective as well, it's not just the illegal firearms. We've got to make sure that we maintain the, the uh, safety and security of, uh, of legal firearms as well. And that uh, side of, uh, of, of the community does a great job in that. And I think the more that we have of illegal firearms or not licensed firearms uh, being given to an opportunity of a break and enter or a stealing and so forth and the, having that opportunist crime of coming across a firearm reduced, I think that's a great benefit uh, to all of the community and uh, I certainly do thank all members of the community who have participated and, uh, and done the right thing. What happens to the flamethrower and the rocket launcher now? They go back to the people Now what will happen in through from that, there's a number of items there that uh, they will then be licensed because obviously you could imagine that uh, having those uh, items as illegal and uh, people possibly trying to, uh, to hide them away and keep them away from authorities increase the opportunity of them actually being stolen by the wrong element and uh, by doing this, because if they came into the hands of the wrong element, is uh, they could certainly cause severe damage. A, a rocket launcher's capacity to go through two, two feet of concrete and, and nine inches of, of metal and uh, it would be quite uh, catastrophic in the hands of the wrong people. But now we, uh, we're able to, to get them uh, either rendered uh, inoperable and be able to uh, find out exactly where they are and, be, and make sure that they're stored uh, in a safe place and less opportunity for a, an offence to develop. How many people did register <coughs> um, <coughs> their firearms Yeah, there was approximately a bit over uh, 13 and a half thousand firearms uh, to be registered, and uh, that uh, that was uh, it was very pleasing to see that because obviously these people had the capacity to be able to have their firearms registered, but obviously they didn't have the motivation, and uh, in some ways it's disappointed that they didn't have that motivation, and it took uh, uh, law changes and mandatory sentences to shock them into reality of the. Uh, of, of, of the risk that they're putting at the rest of the community. So I'm very happy that they have, yeah. Do you, um, Mr. <coughs> do you guys check the ballistics at, at all to see if they've been involved in any crimes? Oh, they certainly do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And when, so is that a process that will now happen over the coming months? Or? Look, yeah, yeah. I, I know we do, we do that uh, periodically with firearms and checks of stolen firearms or firearms that have been involved. There has been a number of firearms, a small number, uh, I'm talking about a handful of firearms already that uh, have been uh, uh, subject to, uh, to stolen property investigations and, uh, and police are following that up. Yep. Can I ask something else? Um, just yeah. in relation oh, to this terror attack <coughs> in the UK overnight, um, is that going to have any sort of bearing on your preparations for G20? Look, Commissioner. Yeah, thanks Minister. Look. Uh, obviously a, a shocking and sickening crime. Uh, we monitor events all over the world in, in our preparation for G20. Um, a sort of attack that um, no one could have foreseen uh, until it happened. But um, we look at all of these uh, aspects, the motivation behind them, how they're carried out, uh, what lessons we can learn uh, from them. So yes, we, we look at every element of every offence that's gone on around the world and factor that into our planning mm. for G20. And I can certainly say from, from my side as, as a minister as well, we have uh, regular briefs. Uh, we are well ahead of, of, of all our planning phases uh, in relation to the cooperation and coordination both on state and federal level uh, from all risk out angles. And uh, we have a team under Assistant Commissioner Katerina Carroll uh, who is certainly advanced in uh, ensuring that we have all possible uh, scenarios, task, and uh, and it, it will be a uh, it be a magnificent event uh, for Queensland, and I'm sure that uh, we'll have the resources and the motivation and the, and the people in place to uh, to cover all those unexpected circumstances, and that's what uh, all those planning phases are currently doing. And I guess that's the, mm. the risk, though, is that you, you can't really <coughs> plan for something like this. 
Look, I think you see extreme, you know, whether it be the Boston uh, Marathon we saw the other day, and uh, I think they highlight the, uh, the, the importance of having all of that planning and preparation in place before an event and people may look and say why are we doing these things and it's great to have a crystal ball in hindsight afterwards but uh, I know the police are doing an immense amount of planning for any possible things. I know when we see this particular instance uh, uh, you know I haven't seen all the details yet but uh, I think everyone's seen it on, on YouTube or uh, in any forms of the media and it is shocking and it sends a chill through people to see the callous way and uh, the way in which ordinary you know perceived members of their community have an extreme view and manifest that by by such vicious acts that uh, and that re is repulsive to everyone in the community and uh, but I can assure you that uh, from the Queensland Police Service it is one of the most professional police services in the world and uh, I have uh, great faith that they can they could meet any uh, planned or um, or, or uh, any uh, particular um, you know, disaster or event that can come their way. Sorry, Acting Commissioner, have you yep. revised the plan that you used to have since the Boston bombing? Since this <coughs> we are constantly updating our security strategies and our planning in the lead up to G20 and, and more broadly. Uh, we meet, as the Minister said, very regularly with our state and federal colleagues to mm. share intelligence about terrorist threats. Um, uh, some of which are obvious, some of them not so obvious, mm -hmm. and we're in a constant state of readiness and preparedness for any event, uh, particularly our focus is obviously on G20 for next year, it's such a, a significant event globally, but we take all of the incidents that have occurred, uh, including the Boston Marathon bombing and today's uh, very savage attack, we treat them very carefully and we consider their context within the Queensland environment and we are always constantly reviewing our plans accordingly. Would you, for example, if the cordon was at a certain spot prior to these things, consider moving the cordon wider out? You know, because of these yeah, look, we, uh, we are constantly reviewing and everything is fluid and assumptions that we make every day about how we're going to react are shaped by events as they occur. So uh, we're not rigid in terms of our security planning. We're very reactive and flexible and take note of these things and the implications they have for us for our security planning. And that will continue every single day mm. until we get to the 14th of November 2014. Can I ask about the Warwick Drug Operation that shut down today? Will that make a huge dent in that, that area of Queensland? Uh, look, <laughs> um, and not specifically, no. But uh, I know that uh, <coughs> all of the drug operations, particularly um, in the smaller regional towns, the impact of local drug dealing is every bit as significant as it is in the cities and in, in many cases more significant because the impact of illegal drugs on people's lives is very well known. So it doesn't matter whether it's in Warwick, Toowoomba, Brisbane, the Gold Coast, Townsville, Cairns. Mm. Uh, the illegal drug trade destroys communities and ruins the lives of people and that's why at the State Drug Squad and in regional policing we put a very high emphasis mm. as was uh, identified in the illicit drug report released by the ACC last week. The effort that Queensland has put into drug detection, mm. uh, we're leading the, leading the country and we're very proud of that and we make no apologies for it. Mm. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a couple of phases to do that, okay? Is, uh, obviously when we came into government, we changed the legislation in relation to uh, the evade police powers, taking it from a mere fine up to over $5,000 and losing your licence for two years. We then introduced the Hooning legislation to impact in relation to making sure there was, there was severe penalties and that your car would be uh, crushed and confiscated. Because all this leads into the scientific and, the, and, the, and the, the information that we have got from academia is that you need proper sentences and you need forceful sentences to send a clear message to those people who think about uh, uh, taking off from police that there is a deterrent in there. What we've also said is that whilst uh, we look at the, uh, the police pursuit uh, 
obviously uh, memora uh, under uh, sorry the, the pursuit powers is that we would review them uh, in the coming well basically in the coming years okay so I've always said we'd look at that to see how we can make it better or we'll maybe change legislation to uh, even make it stronger but the loss of one innocent life on the road has to be taken into account and that's what we'll always do now, there's a lot of misconceptions going out there amongst the community, even amongst a number of police officers. There is, a no, there, is nothing, there is not a no pursuit policy. It is a managed pursuit policy. And uh, obviously, we don't want to put the lives of officers or the general community at risk at any time. Um, there's, there's a letter to the editor of the current yep. police journal from a, an officer who suggests that um, police really are, are powerless to catch criminals unless they're standing still. Uh, I think that's a uh, that's quite entitled to the comment, but the reality is is that's why we have a managed pursuit policy that works in in relation to addressing the the hazards. And some of these decisions are made made in split seconds to make sure that we can get the best outcome for everybody involved. Now, if someone is uh, is stealing a loaf of bread from the shop and they then are pursued by police and a death is ensued, I'm, I'm sure there will be a, a quite a different focus on, on, a pursuit, on a pursuit policy. And that's why we've got to have a balanced approach. And that's why every 12 months we sit down uh, with uh, the Commissioner, myself and, and the Executive to go through uh, the, uh, the, the policies, not just pursuit policies, but right across the board. Look, we'll be looking at it towards the end of this year. Yeah. Commissioner yeah. Stewart has already committed uh, in the past to having a review of the policy mm. uh, within the next six months, well, mm. once we have uh, sufficient data, and uh, he's committed to that. But as the Minister said, the really important uh, statistic to keep in mind <coughs> here is that since the introduction of the new policy, not one single member of the community or a police officer has been killed in a police pursuit. Compare that with what occurred in the previous years, I think that's an outstanding outcome for the community and that's meant the police have not had to uh, turn up and deliver death messages mm. to people about the death of their husband, father, wife, brother mm. who have been killed accidentally as collateral damage in a police pursuit. Oh look, certainly I've had I've had 20 years in the police force before uh, going into politics, and I I certainly understand, uh, you know. Uh, but at the end of the day, we you know we haven't got crystal balls or hindsight. We have to look in what's in front of us and make the best decisions and uh, have the best policy at hand. And that's why we said we'd look at it like in a grown-up way to say, uh, and not in a reactive way to say we'll see, we'll assess this. And that's why, like, those laws, when, when I talked about the herning laws there, right, if you could imagine an operational shift officer, for herning laws under the present scheme, it was taking eight hours to process one hoon. Now they'll be able to be processed with anything in 20 to 30 minutes. So from an organisational, or imagine an officer in charge of a station, that person now has the capacity to get on with you know, other ways to uh, to reduce those dangers, to uh, you know, to get on and get other 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 police responses instead of being tied up behind a desk doing paperwork for eight hours. And I think that will change a whole different uh, culture and perspective towards uh, towards policing because we're actually going to you know, with the technology that we're bringing forward and introducing towards towards the end of this year, police will be 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 able to have a a more hands-on approach, and they won't be. I, I rest assured they won't be doing the paperwork that they're doing now to justify their, their actions. Yeah. Um, Acting Commissioner, can Sorry. I just get some yep. thoughts from you about um, what you think <coughs> officers about the, the pursuit policy and their frustration, whether or not they've hampered them in their ability to mm. do their job? Yeah, there's no doubt it is a significant issue amongst rank and file officers. Um, their uh, instinctive uh, wish is to catch criminals and bring mm. them to justice. That's what we train them for and that's mm. I totally understand that. But the key question for the community has to remain, is the death of an innocent person, an innocent motorist, a price the, com the community is prepared to pay for the unfettered right of police mm. to pursue? And that's, that's a question we've got to grapple with, mm. and it's a, a question that the community also needs to think about. Mm. You know, it's a very high price to pay for an innocent person to be killed uh, 
because the police have an unfettered right to pursue. And that's the, the fine balance we've got to continue mm. to work on. Mm.